Why are you so determined to embarrass me? <laughs> I am not determined to embarrass you. I'm determined oh, yeah. to be taller than you are. The cast of the Harry Potter franchise were all perfectly behaved behind the scenes. I'm an angel. I'm an angel. <laughs> okay, maybe not. But they did share some sweet moments on set, as well as some potentially dangerous ones. If you've ever wondered how slugs taste, or how Ginny coped with being trapped in the Chamber of Secrets, we'll fill you in. Why are you so determined to embarrass me? <laughs> Ginny waited so long for Harry to finally return her affections, but Bonnie Wright wanted to wait even longer before locking lips with Daniel Radcliffe. Apparently, they both felt it was strange to smooch someone they'd grown up with, which made each actor nervous. Needless to say, they didn't quite get this in one take. It took quite a few the first time. Yeah. Bonnie estimates that their nerves caused them to redo this scene 30 times before Harry and Ginny's first kiss looked convincing in The Half-Blood Prince. The lesson Bonnie learned from this? When it comes to kissing or just filming a kiss, sometimes you just have to go for it. We had fun doing it. it was we yeah. joked about, you know. Speaking of awkward on-set kisses, tons of fans were excited to see Hermione and Ron lock lips for the first time. Or at least were willing to put up with it in exchange for never having to hear Lavender say, Go on, Ron. Again. But behind the scenes, Rupert Grint and Emma Watson were both dreading it, since they considered themselves siblings at that point. Believe me, we both wanted it to be over equally as much as the other. As clever as Hermione, Emma came up with a plan. She knows that rather than doing 27 takes, she knew if she committed really early, <laughs> we'd get it. She wasn't about to do 30 takes like Bonnie and Daniel, so she threw herself at Rupert right away. Once we did it, it was, yeah, it was, it was nice. We know Daniel Radcliffe can act, but can he dance? You might not know what to believe after seeing this clip of him and Shafali Shadri at the U-Ball. In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, we learned even witches and wizards have school dances full of drama. Apparently, it took a little time for Harry and Pravati to get their moves right on set. It is just a rehearsal. Later, Daniel claimed to be a fantastic dancer. But because Harry's not very good, I felt like I should play it down. Is he a really bad dancer or a really good actor? Ron's brothers, Fred and George, are notorious troublemakers, but Rupert was the real problem on set. Sometimes stars couldn't help but giggle during a scene, and every cast member in the Harry Potter franchise is guilty of this. But no one caused as many disruptions as Rupert. You shouldn't be laughing at the end when you find out that Dan's gonna potentially be killed by Snape. His laughter distracted his co-stars. I can see Rupert laughing in the mirror, and I can see him, and I can hear him sniggering in my ear. Frustrated the crew. Rupert will start giggling, and he'll pretend he isn't giggling. And ended up causing the need for a penalty system for unsanctioned laughter. Red card. Bonnie was forced to pay up during the Half Blood Prince, during the scene in which Ginny brings Harry a mince pie because she just couldn't stop giggling. In Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, first-year Hogwarts students learn how to fly brooms for the first time. Playing hand games might not be quite as exciting as soaring through the sky on brooms, but it made for some adorable behind-the-scenes moments. Apparently, Emma couldn't help but take playtime seriously, and her cast members noticed a competitive streak right away. Emma, forever competitive Emma slapping hands with Tom Felton was so cute, we can't believe she was smacking him in the face just a few years after this. Hermione, no! He's not worth it. But don't let Emma Watson fool you. She's a competitive and clever person. But that doesn't mean she can't be bad once in a while. This star has broken character due to laughter quite a few times and was seen using her cell phone while on set. On the bed. With her shoes on. Everyone knows electronics don't work at Hogwarts, Emma. As much as we love the movies, they can't incorporate every element from the books, even if we don't like to admit it. One of the things cut from the films was Hermione's oversized front teeth, but it turns out Emma did have some, at least for a while. Am I supposed to have my teeth on? According to Sorcerer's Stone director Chris Columbus, Emma is actually wearing false teeth during this scene, but he realized she couldn't keep acting with them in her mouth. Oh, are you doing magic? Let's see them. What's more difficult than trying to get a big group of kids to cooperate on set? How about trying to keep them in line when they're flying through the air? That was a real problem thanks to all those Quidditch matches, and when we saw dueling in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Maybe that's why Harry usually sticks to a simple disarming spell. Next belly armor. 
As you might have guessed based on this scene we talked about earlier, there was no love lost between Hermione and Draco. Not unless we're talking about Germione fanfiction. But behind the scenes, Emma admits she had a huge crush on Tom Felton when they were kids. That's right, during the first two films, Hermione was really smitten with Draco the entire time. Some people think Emma and Tom are dating in real life, but he claims that when he found out about her crush… I heard it through the grapevine and then eventually you know, we, became, we became good friends. Poor Emma had to film her scene on the Hogwarts Express with fake teeth, while Rupert and Daniel got to stuff their mouths with candy. I've got every single flavor. Well, hopefully not every flavor. George sweared he got a bogey flavored one once. Apparently, nobody ever told Daniel not to play with his food. Get a snake and turn it into a whip. <laughs> Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint are friends in real life, but on set they had a few differences. Apparently, Rupert was a little bit shy and didn't want to be seen while he was getting his hair and makeup done. Rather not be seen like this? Yeah. Meanwhile, Daniel had no problem wearing some different clothes during Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Wow, we're identical. Ron learned about the dangers of a broken wand the hard way, when he ended up cursing himself with a slug vomiting charm in Chamber of Secrets. We know Ron didn't have a lot of fun being cursed, but Rupert didn't exactly enjoy it either. For Rupert, this movie moment was the most challenging part of the franchise at that point. He had to put slimy plastic slugs in his mouth, and then, well, you know. Don't worry, there was at least one upside to filming this scene. But they tasted quite nice, actually. In order to make the process a little bit easier, the crew made sure to add flavoring to the slime, so Rupert was tasting chocolate, fruit, and peppermint. Apparently, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets was full of challenges for the cast, and Bonnie Wright struggled to get through one of the scenes. Ginny Weasley has a bigger part in the second movie, but unfortunately, that was because she was being tormented by you-know-who. She ended up in the Chamber of Secrets, laying on a very cold marble floor. According to Bonnie, the floor was so freezing that she couldn't handle laying on it for long enough to film the scene. So in order to get her through it, the crew hid hot water bottles in her clothes to keep her warm. As poor Ginny grows weaker. Emma Watson has had tons of success, both within the Harry Potter franchise and outside of it. But there was a time when filming Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, she actually missed her mark. Literally. Escaping Gringotts wasn't easy behind the scenes either, but at least there wasn't a real dragon. Well, come on then! Behind the scenes bloopers are one thing, but Helena Bonham Carter did some real damage to one of her co stars while working on Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Bellatrix Lestrange has a real mean streak, while Helena's harm was entirely accidental. During one scene, Bellatrix gets her hands on Neville Longbottom and puts him in peril in front of his friends. It turns out, actor Matthew Lewis was in real danger of her wand. Matthew moved while Helena was poking her wand at his ear, and the two collided. Ouch! Matthew ended up with a perforated eardrum and did didn't come clean about what happened for three days. Don't worry, the pain and hearing loss was temporary, although the jokes kept on going. Helena says she would always shout to ask Matthew if he was alright after this. Don't give it too hard. Shh. Which one of these behind the scenes moments was your favorite? Do you think the cast was perfect together, or would you have preferred some other stars instead? Who's ready for a set tour? The Harry Potter films are filled with magical sets we all secretly wish we live on. But what was building and acting on these sets actually like? As much as we all wish Hogwarts was real, the truth is, only a miniature version of it was created for exterior shots. While that's impressive in itself, there are still locations you'll recognize in the UK that they used for the filming of Harry Potter. Durham Cathedral, Annick Castle, New College, Laycock Abbey, and Gloucester Cathedral all hold a tiny bit of Hogwarts with them, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. The Philosopher's Stone was the only film that they shot in an actual location for the Forbidden Forest. After that, it was all up to the set designers to recapture the magic that came along with it. This was because of Aragog's lair. The most challenging part? Getting the roots right. The roots became the most interesting sculptural part of it, and the roots got bigger and bigger. Not only did they hand sculpt the trees and roots, but Aragog as well. By the end of the films, they had created 600-foot-long backdrops of the Forbidden Forest and trees that were 12 feet in diameter. 
Watching Hogwarts crumble wasn't easy on anyone, especially the set designers. The entire process of creating a destroyed Hogwarts for the big battle took three months and is where the majority of the cast said their goodbyes. While they relied heavily on green screen for the backdrops of the battle, all the rubble, rock, and explosives we see were added in when building the set. I think sometimes when something is destroyed, it shows the scale of it. They also had the extensive challenge of making the rubble soft, yet realistic. This was because there were constantly actors running full speed through the rubble, and they didn't want anyone getting hurt. The majority of the walls and structures were made out of plywood, so they could be realistically destroyed. Diagon Alley was probably one of the more versatile sets the franchise had. It changed for every film, depending on what shops and storefronts were needed for the storyline. However, no matter what, the set designers had the challenge of designing sets that were slanted, crooked, and overall, very unique. The inspiration for this set was the stories of Charles Dickens. There was one scene where they shot on location for Diagon Alley, in the Philosopher's Stone when Harry visits the Leaky Cauldron. That scene was actually filmed at Leadenhall Market. Believe it or not, the Diagon Alley set was also used for Hogsmeade. Told you it was versatile. Because both towns had the same wizardry and magical feel, they would switch storefronts, add in some snow, and anything else that was needed, and they'd have the small town just outside of Hogwarts that we see Harry and his friends exploring in The Prisoner of Azkaban. The first time we see Gringotts in the Philosopher's Stone, the cast actually filmed at the Australia House in London. But jump forward a decade to the Deathly Hallows, and the set designers actually reconstructed the entire set. This was because the flying dragon scene would have been impossible to film otherwise. If you pay attention, you'll see that while it's almost an exact replica, the designers just couldn't find the same exact marble floor or wood paneling. The Weasley Burrow is one of the warmest sets of the entire film, which meant they had to pay extra attention to all the family details. Throughout the films, we've seen many different variations of the burrow, and while they created the interior of the home for the Chamber of Secrets, how could we forget the infamous magical clock and self-washing dishes? They constructed both a new interior and exterior for the Half-Blood Prince. The Ministry of Magic set we see in the Order of the Phoenix took a whole three months to build. It was important for the set designers and director to get this right because it was another extension of the wizarding world that Harry had never seen before. I've never used the visitor's entrance before. Should be fun. The set was so detailed that it included actual fireplaces where the wizards traveled using flu powder, a daily profit stand, bankers, and carts full of parchment being pushed around by some of the 300 extras. The Room of Requirement was probably one of the most difficult sets to film in that the crew designed. While the novel describes the room full of cushions and books, they wanted to go a more neutral route in the film. Stuart's idea was to put the mirrors all, all around the uh, room and, uh, and very quickly we realized you know, that there are no way to avoid reflections. Because the room was surrounded with mirrors, they also needed to figure out the lighting situation, which resulted in many meetings and a discussion to just go the CGI route in order to get rid of them. As for the cast, this set wasn't the most pleasant either. It was just stifling, stifling heat. James Phelps had admitted that he hates the Room of Requirement set. Turns out being in a room full of Hogwarts students practicing magic isn't the most ideal situation after all. In fact, Bonnie Wright called it suffocating. The Great Hall is some of the first magic the characters and the audience get introduced to. The set was built in a studio but was modeled after the real-life Christ Church College. Along with the hall, set designers also crafted Dumbledore's lectern and the Hogwarts House point counter an item that was said to have been the cause for a national shortage of Indian glass beads. If you need any more proof the Great Hall is its own kind of magic, the reaction we see of the first years walking in during Philosopher's Stone is their raw reaction. That was the first time they had stepped onto that set. Whenever we have a new cast member come in, they always talk about when they walked into the Great Hall set because it's just, it's amazing. The Great Hall was used for the six following films and was even transformed for the Yule Ball in The Goblet of Fire, a set actor Warwick Davis loved, mostly because he got the okay to crowd surf during filming. 
We see Dumbledore's office a few times throughout the films, which means they constructed it completely in the studio to use in each film. They made sure that they stuck very close to the books for this set, even including the 48 portraits of the headmasters, bookshelves that had books mentioned in the novels, the Sword of Gryffindor, his memory cabinet, and finally, the Pensieve. This even doubles as the room where Lupin and Harry studied magic together in The Prisoner of Azkaban. They just switched out the props. This Hogwarts washroom set from The Half-Blood Prince may not have been memorable to us, but for Tom Felton, it's one of his favorite scenes he's ever shot. This was because of how practical they made the set for the effects we see on screen. When we did spells, normally not a lot actually happened. But in this case, they rigged the whole bathroom up with explosives. So every time you gave a little flick, something would blow up, which was very satisfying. When Harry makes his way into the Chamber of Secrets in the second film, what we see there was entirely constructed in studio. However, in the last film, they recreated that set using VFX and green screen. Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where I might find platform nine and three quarters? I think you're being funny, do ya? Harry Potter wouldn't be Harry Potter without platform nine and three quarters. There's just something about running through a brick wall that gets you every time. While the majority of these shots were done in the real world at King's Cross Station in London, for the final film, they recreated the platform, the train, and the tracks for interior shots. They transformed an old steam engine into the Hogwarts Express and would film it moving along tracks for exterior shots. We all know how huge the Harry Potter franchise is around the globe, but it is still shocking that they were able to get permission to close down London's Piccadilly Circus for this Deathly Hallows scene. That's basically the Times Square of London. In Deathly Hallows Part 1, Shortly after the Golden Trio leave Fleur and Bill's wedding, they find themselves in Piccadilly Square, surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands, of others. In order to get this scene shot, they had to block off certain parts of the road and gathered crowds of extras to cooperate with their filming, but still ran into other challenges. We were surrounded by paparazzi, which is also not great because of the flashing of their cameras. You'd think working on one of the biggest movie franchises of all time would make actors nothing but smiles. Yet, some of the biggest names in the Harry Potter series actually had parts of the job they hated. Let's take the train back to Hogwarts and find out more. Mr. Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe, was not only first on the call sheet, but also first on the list of actors who struggled with the movies. But to be honest, when you think about some of Daniel's reasons, they make sense. For starters, there were some specific scenes he struggled with, like in The Goblet of Fire. He has to pretend to fall from the top of the castle while being chased by a dragon. Now, before you start shouting at the screen, I'm aware both the castle and the dragon were CGI, but they still had to put Radcliffe on a wire and drop him like really fast to make it look real. Because it was very, very physical. And what is real is that it scared the living daylights out of him. And speaking of uncomfortable scenes, he also didn't particularly enjoy all the Quidditch scenes. Not because of the heights, but because they'd strap him to a broomstick for hours and hours. And as you can imagine, the broomstick was in a fairly sensitive area of his body. We'll just leave it there. Radcliffe also had issues with the process as a whole. He and the other child actors had basically zero acting experience going in, so they were learning how to act while doing it in front of an entire set full of cast and crew and on camera for the world to see. It was arguably the most anticipated series of all time, too. That's a lot of pressure for an actor, regardless of age. So he avoids watching the movies unless he has to. I see them at the, at the premiere, and then if I can, I avoid ever watching them You again. avoid them? Yes. Because when Daniel does look back at the early movies especially, he gets really frustrated at his performances. He's on record saying that when he watches them, he sees himself making acting mistakes that like everyone makes at the beginning of their career. But unlike everyone else, he didn't get to make them in an acting class or a rehearsal room. Instead, they're permanently out there for the world to see. I think it would just be, it's, you know, it's like passing around baby photos of yourself. It's not an enjoyable experience. But his issues with his acting go further than that. Even as far as the sixth movie, The Half-Blood Prince, he doesn't like his performance. He's called it one note and accuses himself of being complacent about the process. Though I should note, he had nice things to say about what he did in The Order of the Phoenix. So that's something. But unfortunately, the issues for Daniel extended to more than just cringing at the movies. The pressure of the gig actually led to him developing a drinking problem. He's talked about having an addictive personality, and the scrutiny and pressures of being the one and only Harry Potter definitely made that side of him come out. He was drinking every day, and not just like casual sips. He did make sure to say he was never drinking while he filmed the movies. 
and fortunately he was able to get the problem under control and quit drinking altogether in 2010. As we all know, Daniel wasn't the only kid actor having to learn how to act while on camera. Emma Watson has talked about having the same frustration as Daniel, only with an added twist. Early on, as Emma was filming, she had a kind of hilarious habit of mouthing along to everyone else's lines as they said them. A stone that may skull and stops you from dying. No wonder Snape's after it. Which, to be honest, is a total Hermione Granger move, am I right? Leviosa, not Leviosa. But it wasn't hilarious to Emma. You laugh. Uh, this is actually quite traumatic for me. She also had issues throughout the series with her independence, or rather, her lack of one. She's talked about how tough it was to basically have every minute of all her days mapped out for her, minute by minute, and how she didn't have any control over it. So she was told when she'd be picked up and brought to the set, when to eat, and when there was enough time between shots for her to use the restroom. It got under her skin so much, she seriously considered leaving the series halfway through. The strain of fame was another factor, and hers was maybe even worse than Daniel Radcliffe's in the sense that she had to deal with a literal stalker. A dude showed up at her school one day trying to find her, and from then on she had to hire private bodyguards to protect her. Like Radcliffe, Emma also had particular movies and scenes she hated shooting. For starters, she talked about how the shoot for Deathly Hallows Part 1 involved a ton of outdoor shots that took forever. It was a grueling process that was just a little too intense for Emma. But she even had issues with some indoor scenes too, like when she had to wear a dress and enter the ballroom to dance with Victor Crump. She got so like flummoxed with all the directions that the director was shouting at her, she ended up falling down the stairs. Oof. And maybe the hardest shot for her was inside the Chamber of Secrets in Deathly Hallows Part 2. Not because of anything physically rigorous, but because she had to kiss Rupert Grint, aka Ron Weasley. The two were close friends and had been basically growing up together on set, so to her it felt like kissing a sibling. Hey, you know what feels like the opposite of kissing a sibling? Subscribing to the channel. Just saying. Anyway, Emma wasn't alone in that particular feeling. Rupert talked about how strange it was to kiss his friend and that they were both super self-conscious as they slowly leaned in. He said he was relieved when it only took him four takes to get the shot. And like Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert also had his issues with the Quidditch scenes for the same uncomfortable reasons. You guys, I think it's safe to say that nobody likes to have trouble sitting after spending hours with a broomstick wedged between their legs. Plus, Ron had the added fun of being smacked one time in the face by a quaffle. I always assumed those were done with CGI, but apparently they're real, so now I'm questioning everything. But that's my own burden, don't worry about me. Rupert also has arachnophobia, aka fear of spiders, so it was not super fun for him to film the scene where he has to face a giant spider, Aragog. Because even though the final product had a CG spider, they still tried some takes with an animatronic one too. I had a full-on panic attack and we never did it again. Rupert's also talked about the fact that not only was he never trying to act as a career, but he's also a total introvert. So that's probably not a great combo when you become one of the most famous child actors in the world. He had a really hard time adjusting to his total lack of anonymity, even going so far as to say it's like having a split personality. Like he's almost had to create a different personality in his mind for when he's out and getting bombarded by fans and people taking photos. Yikes. He even talked about quitting acting after the series ended, not necessarily because he didn't enjoy it, but because he felt like he'd missed out on having a normal childhood. So he was just looking to be a real person out in the world for a while. And I'm sure the fact that he had already made several lifetimes worth of money from the movies made the idea of quitting a little less scary. Besides our main trio, there were some other actors who took issue with elements of being in the Potter movies. But he was still super heartthrobby as Cedric Diggory. Sadly, Cedric dies at the hands of Voldemort, and this scene was pretty uncomfortable for Mr. Twilight to film. To make his body contort in the right way for the death to look real, they had to wrap a wire around his <clears throat> groin region, and then they propelled him backwards. It was quite unpleasant on his little diggeries. He also said it was really hard filming all the underwater scenes. Dame Maggie Smith didn't have any underwater scenes, but she still found the whole process unpleasant, and not for reasons you might expect. Smith, aka Professor Minerva McGonagall, is a legend of acting, particularly in Britain. Her issues have less to do with the Harry Potter series itself, and more about movies and TV as mediums. She's such a fanatic for stage acting that she finds movie and TV roles to be pretty unsatisfying, and that includes both the Potter series and her incredible role in Downton Abbey. She also didn't really care for the heavy weight of the hats they had her wear in Harry Potter. But that seems pretty reasonable. Please don't make older folks wear unnecessarily heavy clothing, people. 
The costuming wasn't too much of a burden on the late great Alan Rickman, but he had other issues. He, of course, played Professor Severus Snape. And despite absolutely nailing the role and endearing himself to a younger generation of fans who don't know about the amazingness of Hans Gruber, he wasn't super happy with his part. After Rickman died, some of his letters were sold at an auction, and in them there were some disparaging things he had written about the journey of Snape over the course of the movies. He apparently felt like one of the directors, David Yates, was abandoning some of the potential character arc for Snape in an effort to simply appeal to teens. Of course, since that's exactly who the movie was marketed to, it's hard to fault Yates for that. Finally, we have John Cleese, one of the most revered comic actors of all time and a member of the legendary Monty Python sketch group. While on Graham Norton's talk show, he was seated next to Taylor Swift, Harry Potter, who mentioned what a big fan she was of the Potter movies. Cleese's reaction was pretty dismaying to Taylor, basically slamming the movies. It was awful. And I can see his point, really. The movies are like 90% CGI, so I can imagine that actors who have been at it for years, acting opposite a green screen or a mop with a head on it might be pretty boring. The battle at the Department of Mysteries feels just as intense behind the scenes as with the incredible CGI in the final cut. Whether it was enhancing flames during the Battle of the Weasleys or adding magical effects to the Battle of Hogwarts, the Harry Potter team did it all. Because we are the high-tech multi-million dollar production that, that we are, um, the snake's double was a pole with a boxing glove tied to the end. In the Goblet of Fire, we get one of the most intense battles as Harry and Voldemort face off at the end of the Triwizard Tournament. But behind the scenes, the battle looked pretty different. Of course, lights and effects were added to show the casting of spells in their duel, but editing also had to be done on Ray Fiennes' face to give him the snake-like appearance of Voldemort. Harry's parents make their appearance as well, but while filming, Radcliffe didn't actually have their support behind him. The two actors filmed their parts at a different time and in a completely different space. After the fact, the editors managed to tie it all together flawlessly. This emotional battle was just as intense while filming as the completed fight in the final cut. We can totally believe they were dodging spells and trying to claim a victory without seeing the lights of spells being cast. The tension in the room, especially as Bellatrix takes Sirius out, is very evident. I kept on doing like ping pong sounds. During the Battle of Hogwarts, Voldemort and Harry make their way throughout the castle, battling in any room they can find. This epic staircase duel was no different. While behind the scenes they were really on rubble-covered steps, the rest of the scene looked much less violent and magical without the CGI. Their acting energy was high, and the Harry Potter and Voldemort actors waved their arms, dueling for their lives. In the end, as the two go head-to-head -head for the last time, we see an emotional but much calmer scene than in the movie, and of course, Rafe Fiennes doesn't dissolve into the air after his defeat. The battle in the Astronomy Tower is quiet and still without the CGI. The mood on the set while filming was quite similar. Behind the scenes looks just as dark as we feel seeing the final cut of this heartbreaking moment and the loss of Dumbledore with the smallest spell from Snape. Yes, I'm the Half-Blood Prince. The major battle of Hogwarts in the final film was just as chaotic behind the scenes. Instead of CGI people, huge crowds of actors were on the set amid the rubble, while camera people ran backwards through them, capturing all the action. The Dumbledore and Potter duo facing off with Voldemort is filled with fire on screen, but without the special effects, it looks like a bit of a different story. Of course, we couldn't get a real fiery Nagini or construct the entire Ministry set, so CGI filled in all the details. Hogwarts was in a seriously desperate state while under attack. From the fiery Quidditch Stadium to the countless spells being cast, none of which we see in the unedited footage. CGI was key to amplify the gruesome scene as more enemies stormed the castle. Neville's fall was also made a reality thanks to some excellent editing of the shots captured on set. That went well. <laughs> what could be better than one Potter? The seven Potters battling and racing away to get Harry and themselves into the Wizarding World safely involved a ton of CGI, especially when it came to the speedy motorcycle chase with Hagrid. Harry, no! 
CGI was important to amplify all the flames and environment for the wicked battle at the Weasleys. But surprisingly, behind the scenes was nearly as flame-filled. The space did have actual hay surrounding them alongside a few fires to perform with, but the vast field was in fact a blue screen on set. But there's one condition. You must obey every command I give you without question. Dumbledore facing the cave infested with Inferi is dark and terrifying. And behind the scenes on a partially constructed set, Michael Gambon brought the intensity acting pretty well on his own. The film crew included real fires and moving lights to help create the right effects. Underwater filming was extremely intense even without all the added effects. To help depict Radcliffe's struggle, a rope was tied around him to pull him and give the right sensation. Thank goodness for the CGI used to erase the rope from the image afterwards. Of course, the Horcrux itself was edited into the shot as well. What brings you here, Potter? I could ask you the same. On set filming the Battle in the Room of Requirement, the actors were surrounded by real flames, climbing practical sets and, on occasion, sporting safety harnesses to pull off all the magic. Behind the scenes, we don't see the fire snake whipping through the piles of furniture either, but the performers definitely make us believe it's there. While a large space was built to film the scene, much of the Room of Requirement is actually completely CGI, from the pillars to the floors. The Hungarian Horn Tail. Facing off with the Hungarian horn tail was no small feat, and Radcliffe brought it with his performance in the first task of the Triwizard Tournament. The CGI dragon's movements were based on that of a hawk. This and the animation of the creature were digitally rendered and added to the final image. Luckily on set there were no real Dementors, but it did mean Daniel Radcliffe had to be hooked up to a rig that could maneuver and lift him while the actor pretended to be choked. When editing time came around, the intricate work began and the digitally rendered Dementors took their place. Harry talks in his sleep. One last visit to the Chamber of Secrets to destroy a Horcrux, but for this very wet scene, a strategically set up green screen acted as the base for when Ron and Hermione used the power of a basilisk fang. A combination of CGI waves bursting up around them and the real wave of water soaking the actors made for an epic scene. We saw Maggie Smith come to life as she exerted the most graceful power, facing off with and making a fool of Snape in the midst of the war at Hogwarts. CGI was responsible for the effects of the spells, but Smith was responsible for the fierce power. Harry, you do realize what tree this is? Hermione and Harry versus the Whomping Willow wouldn't have been possible without the added special effects that brought the tree to life and made it a force to be reckoned with. When the scene got a bit more intense, Watson wound up swinging around on a prop branch, while Radcliffe tried to avoid being hit by what would eventually be the tree's trunk. The actual set the burning of Hagrid's home was filled on wasn't too different from what we see in the final film. Aside from some effects to augment the dark and gloomy scene, the fact that there's an actual explosion taking place on set adds a major wow factor to this heartbreaking scene as Bellatrix celebrates all the havoc she's caused. Fred, I've been thinking exactly the same thing. Fred and George really stick it to Umbridge with a literally explosive exit from Hogwarts, wreaking complete havoc throughout the dining hall. The twins filmed their flying separately on a broom in a green screen setting, enabling the editors to add their images to the chaos of the dining hall. We know by now it's not just people or animals that can be dangerous. Plants can be fierce in the world of Harry Potter and the maze didn't go easy on Cedric Diggory. Instead of vines wrapped around him, Robert Pattinson was tied up in a rope and pulled to mimic the way the ferocious plant drags and traps him. For a moment there I thought you were you were going to let it get me. For a moment, so did I. I have a terrible facial hair problem. While the professors in Harry Potter may have a wand up there, you know what. The actors themselves love pulling pranks and laughing on set. I remember when it was called a one broomstick. <laughs> Number one, disrespecting Professor Umbridge is something we can get behind. 
While we can't tell you why this deleted scene of Professor Trelawney exists, we are just so glad that it does. The theory is they were just doing a long pan shot of all the professors and Emma Thompson was improvising and being so ridiculous, they paused and focused on her. Who that ought to be? Seriously, we could just sit here and watch this for another minute or two, maybe an hour. Or how about the entirety of Harry Potter told through Professor Trelawney's eyes? Thank you, Professor Umbridge. That really was most illuminating. Number two, the internet will never let Daniel Radcliffe forget this one. Michael Gambon and Alan Rickman pulled the best prank on Dan. Really, really funny. And for you? While he's supposed to be silently sleeping in a room full of other young wizards, the mayhem began. In our dreams, we enter completely our own world. The best part was... Dan has us to have his sleeping bag next to this particular girl that he fancied. It was Alan Rickman who planted the fart machine. And we like to, we like to swim in the deepest waters. But it was Michael who was pressing the button. <laughs> Michael and Alan were good buddies on set. Michael was always making Alan laugh, and they were lucky if they got a take where he didn't crack. So you are CE. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, we would take Maggie Smith as our dance partner any day of the week. This leg moves fast. Maggie, in character, teaching Rupert Grint to dance while she's hanging out in her robe is just hilarious. Put your hand on my, your right hand on my waist. It's probably good we've got visuals to describe the scene, otherwise you might have thought something else. No, you will have to lead eventually. Her metaphors are the perfect cocktail of elegance and quirkiness. Inside every boy, a lordly lion prepared to prance. And Rupert Grint was just a wee bit embarrassed of the whole situation, telling onlookers that no one is to breathe a word about the moment. Never gonna let him forget this, are you? Never. Number four, magic meets technology. Alan Rickman whacked his hand off the camera and only had this anticlimactic thing to say. And yet, it's still hilarious. He's not one to break character too much unless Michael Gambon's around, but odds are this footage wasn't salvageable anyways. Number five, a thousand takes would make for a long day. Robbie Coltrane's responses to literally everything are just hilarious. Take time. One thousand take one. Was that a thousand? Yeah. Well, hey! Robbie, we're not sure a thousand takes is necessarily a good thing. We do our best to do it. Number six. If only Ron were as talented with a wand as he is with a quill, Rupert Grint was caught doodling a nasty image of Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman was standing right behind me and I was so scared. Life imitates art sometimes. If you're playing the quote unquote evil dark arts teacher, you should just expect some sassy students. The picture wasn't nice either. It was, uh, yeah, I think I exaggerated a few of his features. <laughs> well, Alan Rickman, like the true gentleman he is, kept Rupert's art. I made him sign it and I have it in my possession. <laughs> and I'm very fond of it. Number seven, now for the hero of our generation. When Filch's cat is petrified, in the movie, Kenneth Branagh's character said, Ah, thought so. So unlucky I wasn't there. I know exactly the counter curse that could have spared her. But we found another improvised take. It was definitely a curse that killed her. Probably the transmigrifian torture. Encountered it myself once in Ouagadougou. Number eight, poor Richard was too gentle for this world. Richard Harris thought the animatronic of Fox the Phoenix was real. And so when no one else was in the room, he was interacting with the bird. And the sneaky tech people were puppeting said animatronic from outside of the room to let him believe in the magic. Nobody ever told him the bird was fake. And we think it's just better that way. Pretty good, huh? Number nine, children are a nuisance. While Professor McGonagall would never threaten to hurt a student, we never use transfiguration as a punishment. Maggie Smith might not be so strict with herself. 
Like, how about this moment? She pretends she's going to thump one of the kids with a scroll. Yes, yes, we know, it's all teasing. Number 10. <laughs> Robbie Coltrane goofing about in the motorcycle makes everyone on set burst out into giggles, including Dan. <laughs> This lovable goof can probably make even the grumpiest of people laugh on a bad day. Number 11. And our least favorite professor is full of personality. While Professor Umbridge is evil in the movie, behind the scenes Imelda Staunton and McGonagall were best buds. Imelda sings, Oh, this hurt. Yes. <laughs> And she blah blah blahs about. Blah 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 blah. Disloyalty. Oh. Number 12. We still find it hard to believe Hogwarts hosts a rave. Did you know Professor Flitwick crowd surfing at the Yule Ball was only meant to be a joke? It's true. I said, wouldn't it be funny if Flitwick did a stage dive? The director went away for the weekend and Warwick Davis couldn't believe his ears. He said, we're going to do that. And I said, I was only joking. Here's hoping he enjoyed himself and maybe ticked something off the bucket list. Number 13. Never let go, Filch. Take your hands off me, you filthy squib! David Bradley wasn't meant to hang on to Tom Felton forever, but he just wasn't ready to let go, even while the cameras weren't rolling. But hey, maybe he had a perfect grip and just didn't want to lose it. Number 14. What is it with Harry Potter and gas? He was a little boy, obviously, in the first one, and he said he was really traumatized by her. Miriam Margulies hasn't bothered to watch most of the Harry Potter movies. Well, I've only been to the one ones I'm in, and I fall asleep. <laughs> if you remember Professor Sprout with the screaming plants, she's not happy about her time on Harry Potter. Or rather, not happy she wasn't in all of them. That was a brave oversight, and I I'm holding them. you responsible. Miriam traumatized Daniel Radcliffe when he was a wee boy. She's quite the character, which you'd know if you've ever seen her on a talk show. Age is but a number, and she's hilarious. I've been told there was a swear jar involved on set. Well, a young Dan didn't appreciate her behavior with the cursing. I was I probably think... careful when it was okay. you, but when, <laughs> you know, with the other kids, I didn't involve <laughs> That wasn't the worst part, though. It was the farting that really got to him. I'm very proud of it. Number 15. It doesn't take Michael Gambon a transformation spell to alter his performance. Michael's a bit of a goofball. When we do the scene now again in a minute, I should change my... <laughs> this cracks up Radcliffe. In a completely different way. Michael, we applaud your nuance. The cast of Harry Potter still leaves us laughing, even all these years later. Do you ever wish you could go back in time and experience it again for the first time? Filming a world of magic can be seriously tough in our world. From almost drowning to facing their worst fears to some very nasty injuries, the Harry Potter actors endured a whole lot of struggle. So let's check out which scenes were some of the most difficult to film over the years. Was oh, yeah? the most horrifying thing either oh. of us but before we dive in, you should probably subscribe to our new channel, The Things Animated, to get all the hidden secrets and unique theories behind your favorite animated movies and shows. Number 1. Well, torture is never really supposed to be fun, so… I couldn't stop crying. Even when you're acting opposite someone as incredible as Helena Bonham Carter, being tortured in a scene is a real challenge. Watson shared that it was quite horrible to do. The actress reacted so intensely that she actually made the Bellatrix actress and director David Yates feel uncomfortable. Number 2. Word of advice, pass on any challenges that involve being underwater. Everyone knew filming this part of the Triwizard Tournament would be a challenge. Dan Radcliffe did some solid training time in the pool with professional divers to prepare for filming, but he was definitely no expert. Meaning at times, he forgot what hand signals meant what. Communication underwater has to be done physically, so when the dive team saw the actor giving the help me signal, they freaked out, worrying that Dan was drowning. This, this confused me. Luckily, the actor wasn't in danger, meaning to signal to everyone that he was actually A-OK. -okay. However, by the end of it all, Radcliffe had spent 41 hours under very cold water. He was lucky the worst he wound up with was just two ear infections. The main thing that really sort of was a bit frustrating. Number 3. The room of requirement couldn't be everything for everyone all the time. 
Unfortunately for Bonnie Wright, this room full of magic and power was really tough to work in because of how claustrophobic she was left feeling. With Dumbledore's army being so big, there was always a crowd, and being confined into such a small space left Wright really struggling. Her on-screen brothers weren't such big fans of the room either. The Phelps twins struggled with how much heat the fireplaces throughout the room emitted, making for some seriously sweaty actors in all those warm sweaters. I've never, I've never told anyone this, but I hated you the cast. room requirement set. Number 4. Her character definitely wouldn't have felt this way. Imelda Staunton really is a great actress. We'd never have believed that she actually felt awful when torturing Radcliffe. The always evil character was the furthest thing away from who Staunton was, and the actress admitted that filming those scenes was a real struggle for her, calling it horrible and unpleasant. Poor Staunton was left feeling guilty for days after the fact whenever she had to go full evil. You know, the scene where she gives him the detention was uncomfortable for me. Number 5. This was a doozy. Cedric losing his life is very sad, but it looks fairly simple technically. The truth is, though, Pattinson suffered during filming because of the stunt he had to do for it. The actor was set up with some wires wrapped around his groin area that would allow him to roll once hit with the unforgivable curse. Let's just say our Pats was very happy when the final cut was called. Number 6. Even his co-stars were shocked he took on a stunt this big. Radcliffe had proven he could take on some stunts himself and perform to the caliber needed safely, so by the time the Goblet of Fire came around, he wanted to amp it up, signing on to perform the big slide down the roof of Hogwarts for the cameras. Sure, he wasn't really on the roof of a castle, but the set that was created did leave him with a 40-foot jump on wires, and it still looks pretty terrifying. I will never be allowed to do something like that again. Number 7. When there are seven Harrys, things get tricky. We'd think that the fact that Radcliffe was the only one actually acting out the scene when he played the rest of his crew disguised as himself would make things easier. But it was straight up tough and kind of endless. It took a whopping 95 takes to capture all the action properly, since Radcliffe had to act out the scene over and over again playing each different part. It was time consuming, but oh so worth it in the end. Number 8. Emma wasn't shy about how much she detested this experience. Yes, I can tell you the worst right now. It was on movie number two, we get dropped by a dragon into the lake. And Rupert wasn't so crazy about it either, considering he thought his heart stopped beating from the cold. It was the middle of winter, and the water they were in wasn't heated, and they couldn't wear any extra layers since they had to change out of their wet clothes so quickly after. Out of the trio, Watson was the only one to have the help of thermal pants. Number 9. Ugh, this part always makes us cry. Sirius's untimely end remains one of the top worst losses in the whole franchise, in part because of Radcliffe's heart-wrenching performance. This was the scream so blood-curdling and guttural that the team couldn't even include it in the film. It had Helena Bonham Carter and Emma Watson in bits, so we can only imagine how brutal it was for Dan in the moment, especially since he'd lost such a close family member around the same time. Number 10. It sounds like a party, but Emma Watson wasn't a fan. Let's face it, kissing someone who's like a brother is tough. Doing it twice? Well, that's just not fair. To make it all worse, when Emma and Dan Radcliffe got together to smooch, the two of them really got stripped down, and neither one was expecting it. Watson shared that, it was the weirdest thing ever, and they only told us about the silver body paint the day before. Watson has been nothing but honest about the experience, explaining that, it was awkward enough as it was without the silver paint and the strapless bra, but whatever. It looks good for the story. As for kissing Rupert, the actress was fully clothed, but it was still tremendously tough to get through, especially because the two had such a hard time staying in character. Emma expressed her frustration, saying, It was supposed to be that dramatic kiss, but Rupert and I continued to laugh. I was really worried that we'd never get to get that scene because we just couldn't take it seriously. Number 11. Animals are cute until you work with them. If any of the actors were fans of monkeys or bats before, they definitely weren't after filming with them. The monkeys couldn't keep calm and were harder to wrangle than the young kids. And some got a bit explicit on set. And Grint had a terrible time when filming with the bats, since one of them decided to do its business on him. Yeah, that ain't cute. Number 12. The spider is huge. 
Rupert Grint was Ron Weasley in almost every way, including the fact that they both suffered pretty serious arachnophobia. The Chamber of Secrets was unquestionably the actor's nightmare. Aragog was portrayed by a giant, creepy animatronic puppet that looked real enough to leave Grinch shaking in his boots. He even called them the scariest scenes to film. Even when they weren't filming, the presence of Aragog on set just gave Rupert the creeps. Number 13. It definitely worked in this case. Professor Snape. Love him or hate him, Alan Rickman gave a stellar performance, and that was partially thanks to method acting. The actor kept in character whenever he was filming on set, so the first scene he filmed with the kids wound up being a real challenge for them. While Rickman definitely didn't mean to, he intimidated some of the young actors so much that they really struggled to focus. We'd be nervous too. Luckily, that quickly went away once they spent some time together off camera, and they saw that smile we all love. Number 14. Fans of the books, remember him? The character didn't make it into the movie, but Rick Mayall had actually been on set and gave a very memorable performance. So why have we never seen it? Well, the actor did such a wonderful job that he caused the young actors to giggle endlessly. And remember, this was for the very first movie, so these kids giggling too long could lead to serious delays in production. They tried filming with the actors back to the kids and with him across the room, but he was just too hilarious every time. Director Christopher Columbus wound up not liking the look in the end, so he just cut the character. Harsh. Number 15. It's fun, but complicated. The high-flying sport never existed before it was written into Harry Potter, so JK went on to create a full, detailed rulebook so the production team could make sense of what it was, how to play, and then film it in a way that would captivate audiences. After all, no one wants to be watching these kids flying around on broomsticks if we have no idea why Harry was so obsessed with finding that golden flying ball, aka the snitch. Their production designer Stuart Craig was the one who took on the daunting task of creating what the pitch would look like, and his design worked like a charm. In the later films, Quidditch became some of the most brutal scenes to film since those broomsticks were not comfortable at all, even with the modifications made to try and give the actors an actual seat to sit on. Oh, and we can't forget, Rupert Grint also got a quaffle to the face at one point. That's gotta hurt. Number 16. They loved it so much they filmed it twice. Okay, well, that wasn't the reason. The production team was forced to reshoot the entire epilogue scene because the first time around, everything was way too rushed and chaotic, especially for such an important moment. All the actors felt really bittersweet, seeing each other looking aged, and knowing this would be the final scene of the franchise. Well, we get teary-eyed just thinking about it. Number 17. Who left the food out? For a team that was usually thinking about everything, it's pretty surprising that no one would have realized what would happen to the real food they filmed with for days on days under super hot lights. The foul-smelling set made filming a total drag for everyone who was close enough to smell the stench. And by the time they got rid of it, that smell was seeping out of the Great Hall. The actors may have been chowing down on real food for the first day, but no one was taking any more bites once their plates were filled with rotten food. A nasty sight for them, a tasty one for us. Number 18. Dan says it best. We were very much just like kids being kids on a set. Filming the early movies, especially the very first one, was an absolute dream for the child actors, but for the adults involved, well, it could be a bit of a nightmare since filming anything with a big group was extremely difficult with children who were distracted by the magic of it all and each other. The big problem was like throughout a take, our attention would like, would wane and come and go. But it was pretty sweet to see how much the little ones enjoyed it. Where they were just so happy to be in a Harry Potter film that they couldn't contain their excitement. They laughed, they cried, they got some serious injuries, and had some very emotional days. But they made some pretty special memories, and of course, very special movies in the process. Dragons. That's the first task. The wizarding world can be a dangerous place. So which of the Harry Potter actors struggled through the most pain? Whether it was because of sets or other cast members, these actors were left bleeding, bruised, and battered, all in the name of art. So let's see just how much damage they endured. Harry! Come on, ow! Are you right? You must be freezing! Number one, it just hurts so good. Poor Dan Radcliffe struggled through the most painful first day on set that he could have imagined. That first day, we were trying to get Dan's eyes to be green because that's what they are in the book. Sporting green contact lenses that gave him a wildly painful allergic reaction. 
This was so brutal that he couldn't even bear to wear them another day. We removed the contacts and he's never had green eyes since. Which explains why we never really got those famous Lily Potter green eyes. You have your mum off his eyes, yeah. Absolutely and unequivocally no. Number two, this queen took him down. Rupert Grint didn't know what hit him. I'll be a knight. During the giant chess game, the moment Ron was struck by the queen wound up being way more painful than anyone intended. Grint got nicked in the face by a rogue rock and was left bleeding. The evidence of what happened even made the final cut. Ron! Don't forget, we're still playing. Number three, like son, like father. After seeing this deleted scene, we can without a doubt see why Draco is the way he is. For Tom, his on-screen father could be intimidating. Working with Jason was not always a treat. Just immediately turned into the most unfriendly, horrible person. And Tom even had the cuts to prove it. Jason Isaacs came into filming his first scene with all the Malfoy cruelty in check, smacking Tom's hand on set, not realizing just how much damage those fangs on the end of his stick could do. Tom was left bleeding and with tears in his eyes, but... It's all right. It's good for the scene. Number four, Snow can do some serious damage. The final cut of Prisoner of Azkaban even shows us how Felton was feeling about those snowballs when he visibly flinched before even getting smacked. Who is that? A snowball fight can be fun for one day, but going at it over and over and over again? Well, that snow can hurt. Bloody hell, Harry. <laughs> that was not funny. Number five, rule number one, don't mess with Hermione. Such a good moment. One of the all-time greatest moments in the HP series is no doubt when Hermione delivers a knuckle sandwich for the ages. And while they did it fairly safely on set, the prep to do so wasn't so smooth. A film earlier, Tom wanted to practice so they could get comfortable with it. But what he didn't realize is that Emma would have no problem at all delivering a vicious slap across his cheek. Quite frankly, he's been asking for it. Emma has admitted, looking back on it, that she had no idea what she was thinking. Never again did Tom offer himself to that kind of torture. The sting of that slap stayed with him. That felt good. Not good. Brilliant. Number six. The struggle was real. Harry did spend a fair amount of time of the Goblet of Fire film underwater, so the fact that he racked up a whopping 40 hours in the water tank is not surprising. And because of that, we can understand why he also wound up with two ear infections during the filming process. The pain really never stopped with this one. Number seven, it wasn't just the actors who suffered on this set. Director Mike Newell really liked to get into the action and wanted to make sure he could get the best performances out of his actors. When it came time for the Weasley twins to fight, Newell wanted to see even more fire instead of the prissy work he described he was seeing. But this director learned his lesson, saying, Of course, I was a tubby 60-year-old gent at the, that stage, and I really shouldn't have done it. And why is that? Well, because when he got into it, this director wound up breaking two of his ribs while demonstrating how to fight. He wasn't feeling like such a tough guy after that one. You know when you shouldn't break a director's rib? <sighs> Number eight. The Triwizard Tournament was tough from the start. While Dan wound up in pretty rough shape afterwards, he did get to perform one of the coolest stunts he'd ever done, a major 40-foot slide down the roof. Understandably, he was terrified, and his body was feeling it after the fact. Dan shared what the experience was like, saying, I was on a wire, but I was properly in free fall. It was only there to catch me at the end. Number nine, not the kind you're thinking, though. Matthew Lewis struggled through the early years, forced to look like nerdy Neville around all the kids growing up. Why is it always me? And then he endured some seriously painful torture after Helena Bonham Carter accidentally stabbed him in the ear with her wand. Now this left Lewis in agonizing pain, nursing a perforated eardrum. He could hide his pain well since no one actually knew until after the fact when he confessed that he was indeed suffering internal bleeding. Number 10. Good friends know when it's time to put a friend in their place. Hermione was ready to call Harry out if he ever crossed a line. And this one, well, he paid the price for. I'm the chosen one. Yeah, that's not what she was wanting to hear from Dan. That said, her brutal reaction left the actor with a sore face afterwards. You're laughing because you hit me so hard, aren't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What can we say? Hermione is a firecracker you don't want to mess with. 
Number 11. This can't end well. And surprise, surprise, it didn't. As if Radcliffe hadn't faced enough hardships on these sets, filming's left him with a brutal cut on his lip. This wasn't just any snake he was facing off with. The snake Radcliffe was going tete a tete with was the stunt coordinator on the film, who was wielding a pole with a boxing glove stuck on the end of it. And in one take, they got a bit too feisty. Radcliffe shared that. It went up and smacked me in the mouth, and my teeth went really hard into my gum, so I had a fat lip for about a day. Number 12. You gotta do what you gotta do. And Hermione was ready to get to work, even if Harry was hesitant. But she needed that hair to make the polyjuice potion. Yikes, though. Watson definitely did not mean to hurt Dan in the process, only to help him. But as we've seen, sometimes Hermione just knows what's best. I am still very much in touch with everyone that I worked with. Number 13. Emma could also cause herself some pain. Growing up on set meant Watson could feel comfortable to experiment and try pushing herself in ways that one may normally not be able to. And to be fair, she did go a bit too far with this one. Acting like you're being tortured doesn't really sound like an appealing day on set. But it was particularly bad for Watson, who kind of lost herself in it and caused some serious pain to her psyche. The physical aspect was rough too, and all that torture action left her body feeling really sore and exhausted by the end. But she did give the performance of a lifetime. Number 14. That's not quite the way you want to leave a set. But unfortunately for Dan, bruises took over his body. The final film of the franchise had stunts that Dan described as the greatest physical challenges. He'd faced off with vicious creatures, but it was scaling up chaotically piled furniture in the room of requirement while trying to find Ravenclaw's diadem that really threw him. The fact that he spent a full seven hours doing it meant he was black and blue all over. By the end of the day, I was just bruised and battered. Number 15. It was the battle of a lifetime. Come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started. Together. And considering how it turned out, well, it was a win for Harry, but Dan paid the painful price. Ray Fiennes didn't hold back, and Dan could feel it. He explained, I wore padding, but he missed it a couple of times, so anyone who doesn't like me can come to the movie and see me getting beaten up. To be fair, did we really think Voldemort would go down without a fight? But we did about three or four takes, and it was a really intense moment. So what we can conclude is that being part of the Harry Potter franchise was a serious hazard, even if you weren't acting in it, as director Mike Newell unfortunately found out. Which situation sounds most painful to you? 